Hey friends, it's Melvin. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Here's just a few quick things I wanted to notify you guys about before we get started. First up, very soon, new episodes will be releasing Wednesday mornings rather than Tuesday. So don't panic if you don't see a new episode on Tuesday. Just wait a little longer and you'll see it in your feed. Second, we've introduced a mailbag. Check those show notes and toward the bottom you'll see a mailbag link. You'll then be able to text us any questions you might have about movies, the movie industry, or any movie slash Christian related questions you might have. Then we'll respond in a future episode, so send us your questions now. Up next, Patreon polls, which are available to Patreon supporters at the $3 tier or higher, have been updated. Supporters can now suggest films or shows to be reviewed at the end of each month. The two most liked submissions will become the options for the Patreon poll, so if you want to hear us talk about your favorite movie or show, join our Patreon and start campaigning. And lastly, whether you're a new or long-time listener, please consider writing a review or rating the Cinematic Doctrine podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Apart from financially supporting on Patreon, these are the two most helpful ways to support the show. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. This, these last few weeks have been the worst sleep I've gotten. Um, I have I have fallen into the pit of what Netflix wants, which is you put on an episode and you just keep pressing play and you just keep pressing play. And it really is fantastic how Stranger Things keeps drawing you in. I mean, it's both fantastic and a little scummy because it's so clever. Like they just play a scene that doesn't finish. So you have to play, <laughs> press play to the next episode to finish it. But all this to say is I have watched four seasons. Well, you could say 3.9 seasons of Stranger Things in the last three weeks. Uh, and I have just stayed up so late <laughs> watching just one after another to the point where I think it's actually affecting how much I remember. Because if you don't get good sleep, you your, your memory is actually just functionally worse. So when we're talking about this, please do not be surprised if I do not entirely remember the last three episodes of season three or potentially all of season three. But I will say it has been a good time. Uh, but we are here to talk about, yeah, seasons one through three of Stranger Things, and uh, we'll kind of break it up. And um, but here we are, uh, Dan. Did you um, did you rewatch any of Stranger Things and prep for four, or did you kind of just go into four like most people? Well, maybe not most people. It seemed like a lot of people were rewatching it. But did you um, did you prep? Do any homework before going into this new season? There there was a time when I was a younger man where I would have been like, oh, sick! A new thing is coming out. I time should to do it all again. Yeah, I'm gonna. <laughs> I didn't even like bother watching Jurassic World 2 before I saw Jurassic World 3. I assumed that wouldn't be an issue, but we'll get to that when we record that. Um, but no, like at this point, I-, I foolishly thought that at this point, via just Stranger Things being a property that's pretty well known in pop culture, it being something that I see referenced fairly regularly, it is in some ways Netflix's crowning achievement as a in-house producer of television where like Stranger Things has entered into the pop culture zeitgeist and the consciousness in a way that I don't think anything else they've ever fully in-house made has before. Um, but I found myself not remembering certain things as I started watching Stranger Things season four, partially because each season of Stranger Things at least felt longer, like the more they kept coming out, because the season one of Stranger Things is a relatively quick watch. At least it feels that way. Because the plot moves so quickly, things yeah. happen. Yes. There's no filler. Like everything that happens is important. Mm-hmm. And then, unfortunately, I think season two and three, both of which I overall enjoy, uh, get bogged down in attempting to create a universe out of extremely simple premise, in which I think season four actually kind of reels everything in into it in a satisfying way. At least so far, who knows? The last two episodes could come out and they could be terrible for all we know. But. I did not rewatch the previous Stranger Things seasons, which is why I'm hoping that as you intro seasons two and three, it'll jog my memory because things really overlap, especially because they do have a weird formula, which is end of each season, they beat whatever thing exists. And the next season, an even bigger version of that monster shows up and it's like, oh my gosh, there's another one. <laughs> That's kind of how every season is. Yeah. And they kind of they did di- the, the, the team disperses. And then comes together in the last two episodes. Yes. Um, And and which is interesting, right? Because like, at least in terms of formula, you see how far all the characters get from each other. And then 
they all come together uh, in a way that that really works. It really feels well. Um, not yes. with everything, but especially in season one. And I'm definitely interested to see how they all get together in season four. We shall see. I thought it was going to be the season, like the last season, but apparently it's not stated to be the last season anyway. It just feels that way based on how they're marketing it. Well, uh, brief, brief aside on Rotten Tomatoes, the way they talk about it is like it's the last season. But if you go to IMDb, when they list seasons, they do list the season five category, which doesn't always mean there is going to be one. I'm sure there was listed a season two category for Archive 81, which now is definitely not a thing. Nope. So uh, that could always change. But we do know, yes, that Stranger Things is the massive tentpole property for Netflix. It is their new IP that absolutely killed it. And it's especially interesting, too, because it's TV 14. It means it's much more accessible for everybody. Plus, uh, Winona Ryder's character being a panicked mom captures the parent audience, specifically the mom audience, which typically I, I have a theory that anything that can capture the attention of your mom captures the attention of everybody else. Because if your mom <laughs> thinks it's appropriate, then everybody's allowed to watch if you it. You capture the hearts of moms. He captures the hearts of America. That's, it's just, that's what, I, I'm genuine that's what about they told this. me in film school. It's uh, yeah. it is kind of fascinating that you go back and check out like any kind of thing that's mom horror. So like a quiet place, stuff like that, where it's essentially, what would you uh, define as mom horror, Melvin? Let's, <laughs> Uh, let me go ahead and open up my letterbox list Mommy that I dearest. made of movies that are all mom horror. Uh, this Little is actually mermaid. a throwback to uh, Cinematic Doctrine Purists, who remember tuning into a Quiet Place review during the first year. Let me take a look. I got to find this list. I haven't updated it in a while, so it's probably really far down. Yes, mom horror, horror for moms. So. Basically, uh, I, I guess I just gave myself one sentence. Majority of the plot rev revolves around a mother and stresses unique to moms. So like Baba Duke. So it's basically yep. her raising a kid and the stress of not getting privacy or having your own unique stresses that may be specifically caused by a child that all of culture and society and several thousand years of humanity have told you you're supposed to love and care for. But then the child, you didn't, you don't know who your kid's going to be when you have them. And you're just told to love them, which is a good thing. But you don't know if they're going to be horrible or not. And so you have to endure. I put Bird Box on there. Obviously, I put the first hereditary. Uh, I do have hereditary listed on the top. I put Malignant on here. I'm not sure why. Secret of Nim. I haven't seen that, but I'm sure okay. that's on there. Yeah. Munchausen, which is a short film also by Ari Aster. Uh, I put the first Annabelle movie on there. And I also put on Brightburn. But basically anything where it's like, Ooh, we need to talk about Kevin. That's more of a thriller, I think, or like a psychological drama. But I could put that on there. But yes, you're, you're getting it, though. You, you see it, right? Like <laughs> um, that, like if it's relatively in a, not non inappropriate or non shocking, although hereditary is pretty, pretty darn shocking, um, but stuff like that. And then it also captures the attention and fears of your mother, who then can persevere in the end because Will Byers gets saved or something. Um, then it's fun for the whole family and everyone checks it out and your, your dad, happy father's day, your lame dad who never watches what you watch is peering over the standing up, uh, peering over and checks <laughs> like, it yeah, out. That hopper guy is pretty cool. Cause their mom, cause their wife yeah. is watching it. So they might as well watch it. And then they get engaged because they think hopper is super cool, which he is. Yeah. And so hopper speaks to every American male who just wants to grill, you know, <laughs> just, <laughs> Yes, uh, mornings are for coffee and contemplation, uh, which is definitely speaks to my heart. I don't know why that's not on a T-shirt, but uh, maybe it was. Uh, but who knows? Because, boy, Stranger Things really knows how to market because they cleverly are able to put in things into their seasons, which then can become T-shirts and pins. And uh, Hellfire Club is absolutely killing it. You didn't grab any of those shirts, man. I did order one, <laughs> but I didn't know. Like I, I had that stuff a month before the the show came out and we were hanging it up and I had no context for it. And then I don't think I worked the weekend the show came out. And so I came in that that next Monday or Tuesday and saw it was all gone. I was like, yep, it makes total sense. Um, even the Surfer Pizza Boy ones all went out. But um, all that to say is Stranger Things captures everybody's attention. And uh, apart from that, the first season is also extremely good and extremely accessible because it's not super shocking. It's very clever. It uh, captures kids' attention because you get to watch as kids get to do crazy things. I mean, when we're kids playing with our friends in the backyard, 
Uh, we are thinking up world ending situations and we're cutting off monsters heads and we're fighting things. So we get to see that with the show. One of your friends is the guy with the superpowers. So you get to have all that. Um, yeah, it, it really is kind of this, uh, unique narrative, which is a silly thing to say with how much it copies other stuff for nostalgia's sake, but uniquely, uh, capturing narrative that works for everybody and never necessarily pushes any buttons. And uh, also what I think is really great is grows with this audience because at this point it's been like eight years, I think seven years of the show existing. And by the time you get to the later seasons, the show becomes much more, I wouldn't say adult or mature as if to say it's transgressive, but it's expecting that you have grown up with the show. So you're more prepared for what's going to happen. Yeah. The, the themes, yeah, the themes and the level at which they engage with them grows up with the audience. It's the Harry Potter Toy Story kind of thing where part of what gives the show legs is that it doesn't get stagnant, at least in terms of the characters themselves. So even if all the stuff around the characters isn't super great, my I have this personal feeling and belief that like as long as you get the characters right, your story, movie, television show, whatever – can withstand most scrutiny because that's what's going to really connect the audience and keep them loyal which is a great point because it's probably why season two episode seven is so (laughs) uh damning we all we all know what what you're talking like i I couldn't name off what episode is what for any season stranger things but i know what you're talking about i could have just said (laughs) episode seven and um and if i'm in any conversation with anybody it's that. And you what's know. funny is if anybody watched the Halo show, that's the same episode with the same exact problem. <laughs> it's just bizarre. But um, yes, that when you're talking about strong characters, because these this show really does have just excellent characters. Um, it No matter where the characters are, even if they're in stupid situations, it always works except for episode seven, which is really bizarre um, that it's just that one time that this happens. Gosh, darn it. It's just terrible. Yeah. Hey there. It's your friendly neighborhood call to action. Just checking in on you. Hope you're doing all right. I'm just stopping by to say, you know, if you enjoy the show, you can always subscribe and write a review for Cinematic Doctrine. There's iTunes, Podchaser, basically anywhere you listen. You can give us a shout out with a thumbs up, five stars, gripping positivity. Or if you hate the show, you can say that too. Hey, what? What are you saying? Why are you saying that? Well, I'm not going to tell them what to do, Ted. They're free to do what they want. Our analytics say we got a lot of listeners in the U.S. and you know they love their freedoms. And you're also free to check out our Twitter. Very active there. We host polls, memes. There's also the Cinematic Doctrine Facebook group called Cinematic Doctrine Facebook group. If you want to join, just answer the questions, read the rules, and tell them the podcast sent you. Also, you should check out our website. Some really cool stuff there. Editorials, written reviews for movies we haven't had time to cover. Always check out cinematicdoctrine.com when you get the chance. Oh, uh, Ted also told me I shouldn't forget to mention the Patreon. Something about you can support us or something? Wait, Ted, I thought this was like a hobby thing. You want me to... expand cinematic doctrine. You know this already. Right, right, right. Yeah, I I forgot. I'm the one who put all this together. Yeah, cinematic doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you can gain access to early uncut episodes of the podcast. Oh, and did I mention, you get to tell us what to do. That's right. Each month you get to vote on a movie we discuss on the show. Anyways, I got to run. So I'll see you guys later. But before we start getting all over the place and jumping around, I I figured the best format for us in this episode is probably going to be talk about season one, then talk about season two, talk about season and move on and move forward. So so, Dan, where were you when season one <laughs> of Stranger Things I, dropped? I was in fourth grade, and the teacher said, I have to tell you guys something. And he wheeled in the TV on the stand, and he put in a VHS tape, and we watched news footage of Stranger Things season one premiering. Which is possible. Silence. You could you could see that I joke being made. I am 50 years old. Um, that joke could be made, considering the Blu-ray uh, copy is shaped like a VHS tape. Oh, and by the way, I probably made a little clip in the beginning of this episode. You've already heard it, but head on over to the Cine Doct- Cine- Cinematic Doctrine Twitter, which is titled Cine Doctrine, and uh, the pin post is going to be a giveaway for season one on Blu-ray. Uh, 
here are one of three chances you'll win because I have three copies I'm giving out. And so you have to like and retweet and follow our Twitter and uh, all of the stuff is going to be in there in that little post. It'll tell you what to do. I've made it, but I haven't looked at it in a while because we haven't unveiled it yet. But go check it out. In independent, independent of Melvin, if you throw an extra, like if you tweet your favorite episode of Sin Doctor and your favorite Sin Doc moment, um, the ways in which we've touched your lives I will potentially throw an extra bonus things. Yes. Well, he will do that. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that is not in the tape. intro thing. <laughs> in the <mail. laughs> but, but yes, go to the Cine Doctor Twitter and you will be able to like, retweet, share, uh, do whatever. And you'll be able to enter for that giveaway. It's going to be up for like two weeks, I think, pretty much up until season four. So uh, give it a give it a go. But yes, where where were you for season one. I think people think I'm joking when I say stuff like, if you do this, I'll send you five bucks. But I'm always 100% serious. No one ever takes me up on it. I don't know why. Uh, but uh, I was, how old was I when this came out? Uh, I won't say that out loud. But, 2016. Okay. So you probably were 24, 23. I'm guessing. I don't yeah, really we'll know. Uh, but I was I was young enough where I was where I had disposable income and I was bright eyed. But also I was very plugged in with what was going on in pop culture at the time. And the instant this started, like this came out and really started getting, there was rumblings there. People were talking about, um, have you seen this show? Stranger things. And at first when I saw marketing for it, I had very mixed feelings on it. I don't know what it is. Like I don't have strong eighties nostalgia. And I guess that was a good time as any to where I think part of the power of stranger things is it has a catch all nostalgia. Like, even if you weren't alive during the 80s, even if you didn't grow up during that time, it is broad enough in its handling of nostalgia where it captures the general feelings of being young. You're hanging out yes, with your friends. Absolutely. You know, mm-hmm. your your buddy got a got a got a cool video and you're watching it in your friend's basement while you guys play tabletop games or play video games. Like it captures the essence of being a kid where you're finding yourself. You have your group of friends. You have the things that you like and you know, they have the general struggles that kids have, such as bullying, or not fitting in. Um, but it also captures that wonderful childlike imagination of like there's this one special thing. Like, the again, the power of Harry Potter is that Harry Potter turns out he's the most special, important boy in the whole world. And he goes this whole <laughs> yes. magical world the special. Yeah. Um, it's the Luke Skywalker thing. It's opening your dresser and there's Narnia. And here you have Eleven, where it turns out there's this whole big other world out there that parents just don't get it. You know, they don't understand what's going on with you. You're doing all this stuff because you know that's what needs to happen. The, your parents... Crack open another beer whenever yeah. Mrs. Wheeler comes in to go, just tell me what's going yeah. on. And she'll never know what's going on. That's like my one bingo card for the end of the show is that at some point she finds out what's happening. And she almost did with Billy, but <laughs> almost. But and, uh, uh, I don't remember who's – but there's one character I love. It's this kid's dad who just the whole show, he just doesn't know what's happening. <laughs> oh, just, uh, Mike's dad. Yeah, yeah he's, he's just, just like he's reading the paper. <laughs> like, oh, these stupid kids. And the CIA comes in. You can't tell anyone. Don't worry, we're patriots here. And, like, salute. <laughs> What's going just... on now? <laughs> and uh, Dustin it's... always makes fun of him. <laughs> Dustin's it's... always just like, well, you should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he's lame. <laughs> yeah, and it touches uh... on all the hallmarks of things that you would have like, like, have dripped down from your parents onto you in terms of pop culture, like horror movies and science fiction. Steven Spielberg etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh so i'd heard rumblings about it i was a little over the whole nostalgia thing at the time but i checked it out and i remember the instant i was like maybe 15 20 minutes in the first episode i had this moment of like oh um this is the rare thing that actually 100 lives up to the hype like it i am not disappointed at all i was immediately hooked by it i immediately for me it instantly reminded me of an anime called elfin lied elfin lead I don't know how to pronounce it. Which Man, I watched that first episode and it's just terrible. And then like I heard the show gets worse. So I'm just going to put that out there. Terrible as in? (laughs) As in really bad. It was bad. Yeah. I have watched over 200 anime. There's multiple levels of My anime list hidden out there on the internet. You can judge my taste, but I am confident that my taste is good. And I thought that show was so bad. I could not finish it. It It's one of the first shows I've ever dropped ever if you like ultra gore um you could pro you could probably find like a youtube like someone just cut all the cut all of the action scenes together or something it's really bad and actually part of what's great about stranger things it takes the one or two good ideas from that show and does them a million times better 
which is mysterious. I do understand your connection. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Mysteri- of- which the creators n- have mentioned it as an influence on the show. So, um, which is a mysterious girl with vague psychic abilities is able to do crazy things. And, but, and, but a group of preca- precocious children take her under their wing and watch over her. Um, it's, it just really, it just really just hit. It's one of those rare things that hits all the boxes. It should, it's not too long. There's wonderful amount of mystery, but they don't give you too much information. So there's but a lot every of plot line feeds the mystery. So yes. you Nothing even if there's wasted. yes, if there's even one of the because there's like four groups almost always each season. If one of the groups is doing a plot that's less interesting, it all feeds into Will Byers has gone missing. How can we find him? Yeah, and it so does. The, it um, really helps. Yeah. It does the uh, Twin Peaks thing where there's like a central mystery that sort of key- is the glue that holds everything together. So even when the show is going on these weird diversions, um, there is there's still that hook that keeps you engaged yes. in it. Confidence. You're confident that, OK, I don't like what's happening now, but, but I know <laughs> but it's going to pay off. It's going to pay off. And so it really helps. And this is where I kind of get into my beef with later seasons where. Um, there's a backdrop to Stranger Things, which is the Cold War paranoia. There's obviously it evokes things like um, uh, uh, what's it that uh, all something ultra MK Ultra program, yeah, which is a real thing that happens where the government is trying to <laughs> trying to investigate the possibility of using psychic powers to face their enemies. Uh, I believe the Men Who Stare at Goats is also based on this. Um, so like there's there's enough context where I don't need you to explain to me what's going on. Government is doing shady things. They're scared of Russians. Okay. Like, that's all I need. And I think where I am not as big on seasons two and three is I think they spend too much time trying to explain what happened slash giving more depth to this mystery where I think Stranger season four is better at this, which we'll get into. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't overstate its welcome. It's satisfying. Uh, there's enough of a little twist at the end where if you want more, then maybe they'll make another season. But I'm satisfied by the resolution of the um 11 plot and where she is with her friends and there's a little, cute little romance which is adorable and all the acting is great too i know a writer uh i'm glad this kind of caused her some something of his, another renaissance as an actor she's great of course this is what uh gave david harbour his big breakout in the mainstream plus turk Cause, barrett cause from daredevil the suicide squad this. didn't help <laughs> oh yeah Wait, it, it was like it was, two scenes in suicide yeah, squad <laughs> it rescued him from the from the <laughs> ether that you've been lost in from just being the guy from those scenes from suicide squad yes but it's a great yeah. show like i do really do, like I, I think there's not much else to say about stranger things at least in broadly speaking unless there's specific things you want to talk about because it's just a great show i've yet to hear anyone like come in with a hot takes of how stranger things is actually bad or whatever but it's sort of like when you talk about uh if you if you join the cinematic doctrine facebook group search cinematic doctrine facebook group on facebook to join the facebook group uh but whenever someone posts about superhero movies and one of them goes oh i was really disappointed this this new marvel movie wasn't good and then someone comes out of the woodwork and finally wakes up steps out of their cave their mother basement and goes uh actually all marvel movies are bad and let me tell you why (laughs) you should have expected that even though obviously that's not true um but yes the stranger things is so popular now that it has that group of people that are like actually the better show is only on hbo and nothing else you baby but stranger things is cool and hbo definitely wishes it had what, a what is things, the but... hipster version of stranger things i am not okay with this maybe maybe or just just the movie mid 90s <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess if you put in some superpowers in there but, yeah um yeah uh before we get into season two my, my thoughts on season one yeah is that the show has got a really compelling mystery it's got a uh every plot line again feeds the will buyers mystery it has really good children actors, which for me really speaks to how the Duffer Brothers oh, man. are as actors they, or they, directors. It's hard say. getting one good child actor. They got like five or six good child actors. That's which, crazy. When getting into episode seven is part of the reason <laughs> why it's so bad is because the um, the counterpart, Eight, uh, I forget her character's name, but Eight, she's I think 21 or 22 at the time of filming. And she's just not very good at acting, at least not in this role. Or whoever directed the episode didn't know how to lead her and direct her well. So it's just a massive contrast to quality between having essentially five good child actors and then we're trying to introduce a spinoff show with this lead and she's not very good. So, But yes, uh, you have five really good child actor performers with 
frankly, Will Byers, his his actor being probably the best one, even though he's barely in the show. Um, and he definitely has a lot of performance uh, to shine with in season two. Uh, and then that's kind of it, because I guess they don't know what to do with this character for three and four. But uh, we can talk about that in a minute. Uh, all of the plot's good. The mystery is extremely compelling. The flow of this show is very good. This is when we started to see people talking about how, well, I guess Netflix shows and streaming shows are more like novels because they just keep going and each chapter has a focus and they kind of start and end well and they're long and they sometimes go off on trails and character drama that isn't entirely important but it feeds the character which this is like peak this is at its best uh where every kind of uh, divergent every additional line really really feeds these good characters um the most uh i would say uh pushing this uh to its edge is really the last episode of season one when we start to get more of hopper's background when it's just a little too late it feels like to do that but it 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 helps uh, just enough to feed these characters. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a good, wonderful show. The music is extremely strong. Oh, the they definitely, so good. um, in fact, uh, people usually, I think just uh, talk about it because of its synthesizers and stuff like that. But I think one of its strongest songs is one that sounds like I'm going to get this song here. Cause it's, um, there's a track from the monsters, uh, soundtrack, uh, by John Hop- Hopkins, uh, monsters directed by, uh gareth edwards is that the right one it's not the guy who did the raid it's the guy who did godzilla yes edwards is the godzilla guy but there's this one song called candles and it's huge huge it's like the song that everyone remembers from monsters because no one actually remembers the movie um and one of the tracks in stranger things sounds almost the same it's usually played during quiet dramatic moments between characters who are uh, definitely like romantically involved. You hear it a lot with um, Nancy and Steve. And I think once or twice when it's Nancy and uh, Jonathan, uh, and definitely I think a couple times between uh, Mike and Eleven, but it uh, it's just, a, I, I think it's the one song that everyone forgets because they're, they're thinking about the theme song <laughs> or they're thinking about frankly, one of the worst songs, which is in season two, whenever dramatic things are happening at the end. But uh, yeah, the music is really powerful at drawing on more of that nostalgia. And it's very, it's um, in season one, understated, I would say. And then as the show continues, because they know that that was big for everybody, uh, <laughs> they've really, <laughs> it's not understated anymore. I'll say that. But, Stranger Things is a great example of a show that, for better or for worse, always seems to respond to fan feedback. Like all the time. That is so spot on. And we'll, <laughs> it's probably one of the first things we'll talk about with season two, frankly. But it's like, oh, you like this? <laughs> it's just like, well, you know, I will say, um, speaking again about the, the the pacing, like one thing that I feel like Netflix and this is extremely prevalent with the Disney Plus shows, like all of them is they really grabbed on the idea of like, oh, we're just making really long movies that we're cutting up into episodes. Um, Stranger Things, at least season one specifically, it does still feel like a television show in terms yes. of like episodes have set starting and ending times. You could probably like I could p- picture this airing on television an episode ends and you spend the rest of the week talking about it like the Mandalorian. Actually, I'll retract a bit. Mandalorian does this really well where you could actually watch those Mandalorian episodes in isolation and they work as singular episodes of television. Probably why Mando feels really good in a probably. sea of other shows especially in a sea of star wars which just cannot get a break man but mini yeah. mini rant obi-wan's pretty bad <laughs> but <laughs> i've only watched the first going. episode but it doesn't get better <laughs> it doesn't man i i literally laughed out loud during that first episode when like little baby leia who is supposed to be 10 years old and my, oh wife my goes, gosh I... my wife goes that's a seven-year-old there's no way she's 10 <laughs> and she's running away from these people who are jogging after her even though they're trying to abduct her but one of the safety brothers shows up in the episode for yeah. some reason <laughs> I was, was I, so, freaked out. So I was like, oh my gosh. Like, yeah, I, I did too. I was like, is that Benny like Safty? Yeah. And we pause the episode and Catherine looks it up. Oh my gosh. I'm like, I can't believe he's here just to die. In fact, he doesn't talk like his guy from Good Time threw me off so much. 
Oh yeah, like, that would be so much better. It would be so much more enjoyable, even if it would be really insensitive. But <laughs> Robert Pattinson bursts in like, "We gotta get out of here!" <laughs> like, and he's all disheveled. And Robert whatever. Pattinson would have saved him. Clearly, Obi Wan didn't. But uh, but anyways, but uh, uh, but like just my <laughs> point. Like, imagine just trying to watch a random episode of like Hawkeye, <laughs> just with no context. Like, you couldn't do it. Versus, like, granted, it's not the same as like Suits or X Files, where you could just watch one of those episodes randomly. Yes and generally get the vibe stranger things also is serialized so it wouldn't work as well but it does feel like a show and it helps the pacing it helps it's it helps doesn't the show doesn't feel like a slog to get through and i just think and eight episodes man it's, it's good eight episodes like it's paced really well and eight you wanted good. more by the end you know you were satisfied yes. but you wanted more which is that perfect like uh the wire walk that you have to do when making a show like this um, it is it is a huge, massive success on all fronts. It's the thing that really put the Duffer Brothers on the map. Um, I wasn't super familiar with them. I knew they did stuff for Wayward Pines, which is a sh- one of the a show I watched and no one else watched. And they have a movie hidden, which is pretty good. It's, uh, it's a that. good um, indie horror flick that has a good uh, twist at the end, which uh, going into Stranger Th- or having seen Stranger Things, it was easy to see their um let's let's call it like their their type of creativity and their type of doing storytelling uh is somewhat similar so if you ever just want to get some uh background on their uh creative work definitely check out well, hidden i think it's like 90 minutes they were um long. they were specifically mentored by m night Shyamalan. that definitely explains it so because <laughs> that hidden actually feels like a independent Shyamalan style movie uh now that i think about it so in in all the right ways frankly so it's um yeah. but yeah i just I, I it's it is stranger things season one it really is lightning in a bottle where it appeared with no expectations and it was just this wonderful surprise of a show and it's it's also one of the rare moments where everyone agreed it was good internet liked yeah. it nerds liked it your like you said your mom liked it every like talk show hosts talked liked it like it was it was just, rewatchable just, it was super it's rewatchable. Shockingly rewatchable. Yeah, I've um I've rewatched season one four or five times at this point. Partially because mm-hmm. um I like like you said, when season two came out, I rewatched it. Um it's yes, one of my too. wife's favorite shows, I think. Um she kind of goes back and forth on what her favorites of things are, but it really just it fires on all cylinders. But that leads us into season two yes which, let us talk about season i don't know two. if you want to talk about it or... uh i can start on this one yeah. um because talking about i mean like i asked you where were you when stranger things started um well so stranger things one i knew it was super big i had actually gone on a beach trip with some friends but i wanted to watch it with my sister and so when they stayed up all night to binge the show i went to bed early because i was exhausted um and so then i finally got home watched season one and we more or less watched it in like three days because yeah it's a great show um she was back from college at the time so shout out shirley on uh hope you had fun on archive 81 episode go check that out guys if you haven't listened to it but then i got around to season two i think i was so i think i guess i got married at some point between season one and two now that I think about it <laughs> <laughs> wow marriage that's pretty cool um and so Catherine had never seen season one so we went ahead and watched season one together and I was like man this really is good and and in fact the first time I watched season one I wasn't super into Eleven's plotline because I really I, I, a fish out of water as a trope is really not interesting to me I find the fish out of water trope to be a better as a secondary thing than as a primary this is thing. where we differ I love fish out of water stuff give it to me all day but continue yeah I I know that it's um there's not a lot you can do. And part of what makes fish out of water stuff fun is that you get to see the same trope acted out in different settings. Kind of like how what we like in a superhero movie is the they're using their power. They're learning their powers, but in public situations. Uh, so Spider-Man one where he's using his powers in the school when Flash Thompson tries to punch him in the face, that kind of stuff. Um, so you can't get away from it. But the second time I watched it, I liked the 11 plot line much better because i really did see that like the show isn't just the kids and everyone else is a side character the show is a cast of characters and they're all the main character and uh frankly 11 is the side character of the first season because she's um yeah she's got a main plot line herself that's pretty important but uh the fish out of water trope really doesn't have a lot to do during its i would say like initial phase uh so then we get to uh finishing the season one that second time and i was like this is really great 
now we put on season two. And almost immediately, I'm really not super into what we have for season two. I am a big pro- fan of watching how a show uses a higher budget. And boy, season two just has a significantly higher budget. It's got cool sets. It's got extras. It's got more music. It's got more big stuff going on. But it takes three whole episodes for the show to actually have something happen. And by the time you get to that, you have only two more episodes before episode seven where everything's going to slow down. Um, Well, three more episodes, pardon. Um, And uh, then the show kind of just has two more episodes that really feel super rushed and paced. That's sort of my overview for season two. Um, But yeah, you have a lot of characters going off on different tangential plot lines that don't all meet up. Specifically, my least favorite. Um, Actually, there's two least favorite. So uh, Nancy and John's plot line, I really don't find all that interesting as they go off to whistleblow because uh, after the death of fan favorite season one character, Barb, um, Nancy is feeling uh, not very feeling guilty about the fact that they can't say anything about what happened. So they have this plot line that more or less just dead ends and doesn't really feed into season one, season two much. Uh, and then you have Eleven's plotline, where it starts out really good. I think the best part of season two is actually Eleven and Hopper's relationship. And I think one of the most stressful scenes of the season is when the two of them argue. And Eleven essentially is just the bratty kid who yeah, really is that... way more <laughs> threatening than Hopper. Um, I don't know if you agree, but I think that, that stuff scene, is all great. Like I really like all the fantastic. Hopper stuff. And just as it's being great. She leaves and that stuff ends. And I was so, so disappointed because I was so ready to watch more of that drama because you have two characters that I really like arguing, which means they're both at risk. And that's scary. And uh, that's what I watch shows for. And then she goes off and tries to find out who her mom is and then meets a cast of spinoff characters that will never, (laughs) never get a show. It's and, uh, that episode's directed by Rebecca Thomas, who's one of the people who created Archive 81, too. It's a shame that she got handed, like, the most hated episode of Stranger yeah, Things. Yeah, and then she gets a show that's pretty interesting and then, of course, never gets a continuation. Um, but, yeah, it's... it's uh, So Eleven's plotline devolves into something not interesting. Now, of course, when Eleven joins back with the team, as all of these seasons do, when everyone gets back together, uh, her stuff with Hopper continues to be good uh and i quite enjoy it but it takes a while to get there um will byers has some things to do but he more or less is just doing the same plot line as season one except he gets to be around where (laughs) it's save will byers again except he gets to also act which he gets to have his kubrick scene where he just does a face and he's scary uh in particular a scene when he's um there are tunnels underground and uh We've seen previously that the uh, Hawkins Laboratory, the way they're solving the problem of the spreading creep coming from the zone is to light it on fire. And when they find all these tunnels that are filled with creep, they go down and light it on fire. And Will Byers is connected to the Mind Flayer, the main villain of the, the, the story. So he falls to the ground and essentially has a seizure. And boy, he looks terrifying. And so you just get to see an actor do a scary face. And so they probably coordinated with the Duffer brothers to, or whoever directed the episode to like, try this face, not scary enough, do this, try this. And then, so it's just a great scene. It's absolutely chilling. Um, So there's just some good stuff throughout the season that really, really is cool. And then there's just some stuff that just is not, oh, and I didn't even mention Bob season two's fan favorite episode played by yeah, Sean Aston. I- He's great. He's the best new character of the sh- of the show. <laughs> he he's great. Like I would say, like while we may like pick apart the actual plot, like the secret weapon of Stranger Things is they consistently keep introducing characters that are great that you instantly like. I don't know how they keep pulling it off, and then the characters that already exist, they consistently take them in interesting directions. Like this is where we get yes. the the ongoing evolution of steve harrington who oh, just <laughs> man my heart breaks on episode two and nancy just breaks up with them it's, it's I, sad I hated and... that actually the first time i watched it because i thought narratively it would be more interesting to watch the two of them develop together and so for the whole show i've always just been like come on i want to watch their drama return of course i get to wait till season four when they actually start doing that but 
it was it was one of my biggest frustrations um was that they just the end of season one you think that uh they broke up and then the camera pans over and Steve and Nancy are sitting together at Christmas and everybody collectively goes, no, I can't believe that. Uh, but that was one of my, and I did that, right? Because like, that's what you expected from the season was that it would be John and Nancy and they really pull your chain, Rick, and you think they did um, at that last episode. But uh, yeah, right. O- almost right away. Like you said, they respond to fan stuff so much that uh, and they then cleverly go, what's what, what do fans want? let's make it good so it <laughs> works because like barb everyone likes barb we killed barb off early uh how can we make her important for the plot and like they so they respond to the fan stuff but they do it kind of well they yeah, do it the was, best that's possible <laughs> there's hashtag justice for barb she got cast in riverdale because of the fan petition for stranger things apparently like the people in terms of riverdale were yes. like oh like we'll, we'll bring her in um i will say like it's yeah, Steve Harrington. Like I read that apparently, like the original plan was for him to die in season one, and then they, like they also wanted him to actually be like dating um, Ethan Hawke's daughter in season three. But like they consistently keep not doing their initial plans with Steve Harrington. And and it's always the best choice. Every, every, yeah, every course correction <laughs> for him is great. Like he be- and like again, like fans respond like all the memes about him being a great mom to the kids. Like yeah, they keep yeah, they keep babysitter. responding to that like positively in this case. Um, Sean Astin is Bob, who is this season's sad character that dies. Every season, if there's a favorite character, that character is not making it to the end of the show. I'm shocked the leader of the Hellfire Club is still breathing at this point. Yeah, uh, I, I, think, I, yeah. I think they're playing with that throughout the season, too. They constantly keep putting him in danger and they're like, oh, he's still here. Um, yes, I yes. love Brett Gelman as Murray. Brett Gelman is a hilarious comedian. He has some great shows on Adult Swim. He's the conspiracy theorist guy, Murray who I'm glad becomes a recurring character across the seasons he following gets, this. It, so in response to your idea of they keep introducing characters that are good, I felt that season two is the first time where new characters that are introduced feel cartoonish. And I didn't quite like that. And when we get into season three, we can talk more about cartoonish. But um, but as the show goes on, all of the cartoonish characters become more realistic. And yes. if they weren't good in season in a previous season, they're rehabilitated which i always prefer to just kicking them off although you can only do so much so episode seven they're gone but like <laughs> uh but uh murray i actually did not like in season two but is rehabilitated and made into a really compelling character in season three um and more interesting and well so- like like i said i like brett gellman as a comedian like i think he's funny right so, so that, that definitely helps. helped but i yeah. think i think for for me like the fact he's just like he is the you know he's your tropey like conspiracy theorist who's actually right like i always like those right. characters but but not quite like he has his he has he's generally correct board. but <laughs> and she they come in your timeline's wrong <laughs> that's not right <laughs> you might want to sit down <laughs> that's totally fine for me because like <laughs> the things happening in the show are pretty ridiculous like and he's the oh, only character yes. that kind of acts appropriately towards what's happening yeah but he's a great character to have on hand because as we keep seeing in season three and then really in season four of like you need a guy like this around because of everything that happens like oh man everyone no one else knows about this except murray like let's get like murray yes. like he's a great utility character in that way yes 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 all the characters are kind of cartoony as they're introduced including bob but then as the show develops you're like oh it's actually bob's really great i love him like he's just <laughs> I, he's just like totally okay that their yeah, family is who he they tries are. his best you know he's, he's so sweet he doesn't like he never does that thing where he's like this is ridiculous what do you mean there's blah 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 like he's just like oh okay <laughs> like i guess this is what we're doing and he just goes along and eventually it gets him killed obviously i'm sure that our audience immediately loved bob because he is you know, sean astin lord of the rings but... lord of the rings he is he's but... a good friend in that and he's a good friend in this so. and speaking of all the pitfalls of season two it also has the worst death scene in which bob just like <laughs> i've heard so many arguments why does he just stand there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why do they just look at each other oh man it's like it really is fascinating how season two feels rushed and it is right like there was no real plan and then the duffer brothers only are there for like the first two episodes and the last two episodes and for the most part they stick around for season three and season four as directors alongside sean levy who Really, it's cool to see how he improves as a director through each season. 
um, because he does a couple with season two, Sean Levy being Free Guy and Adam Project and Night at the Museum, (laughs) lest we forget the Night at Museum trilogy. But and now he's going to do Deadpool Deadpool. three because what a weird career Sean Levy has had. What is what actually happens in season two? Um, so Will Byers uh, is still experiencing effects of the upside down. At the end of season one, he vomits a slug, Fred, clearly a not real slug. And it is not the slugs from Harry Potter. It is just a, an upside down slug. And, Which is a uh, great cliffhanger. Good cliffhanger. Uh, I remember not liking it uh, initially because his only character trait in season one was that he was honest and shares with people. And then at the end of season one, <laughs> he's a big old liar. He doesn't do that. <laughs> and I, I, but that was when I was very small brain and developing my understanding of media literacy. <laughs> so I, uh, I obviously rescind that. But uh, so, anyways, he's doing that. Uh, season two introduces Max and Billy, who again are very cartoonish and not very compelling initially, but then grow into being great characters, wonderful characters, both of them. Yeah, the development of Billy is shockingly good in this. Yes, so. and because Billy is so over the top bad, I hate <laughs> to the point him that he's first. annoying. Yeah, yeah I really he, did not like him. Yeah, because he's so over the top. I'm like, what is this guy? <laughs> like, what's his problem? <laughs> and he has no. They have no character. Neither of them. And. Yeah, Max doesn't really have much character other than being just we need a new character to be in this group. So at season two really is I think I really compel you to to go back and watch season two if you haven't yet after, you know, listening to the Cinematic Doctrine podcast for three years and learning how to interpret media, uh, you know, from our, our our crash course of us being particularly great at it. <laughs> us great paragons of, yes. of, of Hollywood. And watch season two and you'll be, it, it really is impressive how it continues to chug along and be very good while also being a mess. Because like I said, those first two episodes, nothing happens. It takes forever to start. And then by the time something starts, you're really, you, you don't have the confidence anymore to go, all right, I'll stick along. Because I didn't even finish my story, but we stopped watching season two at episode seven. I I could, I started, like, we got to episode seven and I'm pausing several times to talk to Catherine. Like, this isn't working. We're both talking about how it doesn't work. I'm sitting upside down and complaining and groaning and just being like, this is terrible. And we just stopped. I never watched season episode eight. Uh, in 2017 until maybe 2019 when season three came out and we decided, all right, let's watch episode eight. I didn't like episode eight. <laughs> I thought it was not as good. And we never watched the show until this year, until the last month where I was like, all right, we got to talk about season four. And I'm, of course, hearing season four is fantastic. So I'm like getting I'm getting the buzz, man. I'm like, I got all right, got to watch it. So I watched season one again. I'm like, wow, this is great. I already knew that, but it's really good. We finally persevere through season two. We get to episode seven and almost the same thing happens where we're pausing it several times, talking about why it doesn't work, um, which I guess we could do briefly before we, of course, go to season three. But um, it's almost it, it, almost at risk of <laughs> not watching this show again. Um, but then we get into season episode eight and episode nine. And I, I quite like those episodes and I thought they uh, functioned better. Episode nine being way better than episode eight. But episode eight still being interesting and probably being condensed. It felt like episode eight was two episodes c- cut down into one because they had to squeeze in an episode seven. I'd really love to know the history of by- behind episode seven, if that was just an extra thrown in. Because if you watch episode one, it feels like there's two introductory scenes. There's the what's happening in Philadelphia with the spinoff crew. And then there's what happens to Will Byers at the arcade, which feels like it ends with the title screen starting, but they don't. So, um, but then, you know, persevering to season three and uh, we'll, of course, get into that uh, in a minute. But uh, do we want to talk about episode seven real quick and why it's so disruptive? What were the intentions for episode yeah, seven? 11 and, and the Funky Bunch where yes. she meets <laughs> with, with her with the backdoor pilot she's she's on the set of uh um friday the 13th part eight uh jason takes manhattan yeah it's or the dream warriors from from nightmare on elm street three it's like very weird it's i think the two main things that immediately cause this to just crater in fan 
reaction. You could not go on the subreddit without every oh, post being about, hey, it. did you guys get to episode seven? Does anyone know? It and was, it's so validating, though, because I'm sure everyone, most people, I don't want to say everyone, but most people probably the same experience I in, did, and probably you, too, where you watch it and you're just like, that was weird. And then later you and go online. And it's the online. shortest episode. It's 40 minutes. It felt like whoever was working on the show went, oh, man, we messed up. We got to cut. We got to get this episode <laughs> Discreetly, over. like, yeah. throwing pages of the script in the trash trash on the way to set like we gotta it is, get rid of this it is um, the pacing is really bad in that episode it's amazing dude oh man yeah like but you go online and you're just like everyone else is like do everyone else think that was weird and you're like oh my gosh yes and so it's this amazing effect of everyone clearly going what the heck was this can you talk about the ending of episode six first do you remember it uh no so the show has been building up that okay. we're finding out the con- basically all the characters have met at this point as every season ends all the characters I'm looking, start meeting. I'm, I'm looking at a, a plot description right now oh the show it, it, everyone has met everyone's yeah. at hawkins lab uh we've finally found out why will it, how will is coordinating earlier in the season will is talked about being the spy right he's going to spy on the mind flare because the mind flare has taken over his body and he can kind of see what the mind flare is doing but then there's a line where it's like but what if the mind flare spies on us what if he learns what we're doing and at the end of episode six, you learn that the mind flayer has tricked them. And Will, as be the great actor, he goes, he's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He spied on us. He used me. I couldn't do it. He was going to hurt me. And so Mike is running up to the guys. Let us out. We got to tell them they're trapped. And then all these guys start getting attacked by demo dogs and they're underground. And then the demo dogs are climbing up this hole. And then as Hopper is and uh, the new lead guy, I forgot the new scientist guy, the not Brenner Brenner guy the nice Brenner, um, they are about to get attacked by Demodogs and it zooms up on the pit and a claw climbs up and you hear the noise. Credits roll. Episode seven starts. The Saved by the Bell theme starts playing. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's just go follow. What's Eleven up to? And it's just yeah. a and different show. <laughs> you know, just, it, it is so strange. It I could see Everything them being like. you've learned about the show. Is which useless is useless at this point because, yes, because it's a different show now. Even the meta text of the show being every episode ends in the middle of a scene to get you to go to the next episode to continue that scene doesn't Very happen yeah. because it cuts to a completely different show. You could actually skip up a sev- episode seven and go to episode eight and it continues that scene. It it It's literally that. And uh, yeah, so we then, of course, and, in that way, seven. you get another eight episode season of Stranger Things if you cut this one episode out. Because yes. then, like, if memory serves me, Eleven just shows back up in the show, like, hey guys, <laughs> they're just like, continues. she shows back up, you know, and not just that. I think she's dressed different. She's right? dressed differently, but the lines that she has with Hopper, because Hopper is the only one who essentially says, why are you dressed like that? And uh, she just goes, cool. I visited mom. Yeah. And so she doesn't even mention the crew from episode seven. So we could have just done a they could have just done a reshoot where for some reason, like she that was the only outfit at the, her mom's house. So she just puts it on and she's just. She see looks over and sees a magazine of what's what's popular and it's slick back hair. Yeah. Looking like a, and so she just. So it was totally editable. <laughs> or like that like that'd be a cool like thing to explore in a later season, right? Where there's this whole mysterious event where Eleven went on a on a journey, met her mom, quote unquote, and then like she has this new outfit. And like that's great for fan theories, fan fiction, fan art, whatever. Um, there's potential there. <laughs> but unfortunately, we actually did see what happened and it. it's terrible. But yeah, so like you have this great cliffhanger, everything's coming together. Like it's it's go time, man. The monsters are showing up. Everything you've together. waited for. And the, then the, the messiness of season two has gotten in the way. But you're here. You're like, all right, let's do it. And yeah, it, the episode seven called chapter seven, The Lost Sister has it's weird in tone. It's completely different from the, rest of the show in how it looks and how it's shot and how it feels. The characters are not good. None of the characters she meets are cool. And it's just. The fact that it doesn't play, it's both a blessing and a curse that, that nothing that happens is of any importance ever, because on the one hand, like it would be terrible if things that were important happened this episode. So you had to watch, you had to revisit it, you had to be familiar with it. But on the other hand, the fact that it's basically non-canonical almost in how it's utilized means that it is a complete waste of time, which just adds to the level of frustration. It gets maybe three mentions from the rest of the show. You learn about the Rainbow Room. Someone else later on says... Uh, so-and-so left before so-and-so left for the rainbow room before you, uh, 
before an event happens, stuff like that. It's like, but for the most part, the only thing that's important is she learns if she's mad, she can be a little more powerful. It's the very, it's the anime <laughs> thing of I can't d- defeat the villain, yes. but the villain's about to hurt my friends, so I can defeat the yeah, villain. <laughs> and then you get all the Chaos Emeralds being supersonic. Um, yes, yes. And it's particularly weird because later in season four, there's a lot of parts where this actually would make a lot of sense to reference, and they just don't like yes. right like this it this it would be when this all this would come back in some way that's important and it just it's especially because there's multiple sequences where characters have flashbacks in season four and this is omitted they don't show any flashbacks to this stuff um it's it is so strange in both like how conceptually i could see netflix or somebody being like hey and none of this is confirmed as far as I know. Maybe you can quickly Google it, you listening to this podcast episode, and see if anyone talks about it. But this does feel like Netflix was like, hey, like we have like seven Marvel shows or whatever, and they keep creating more spinoffs and whatever. Maybe Nef- maybe Stranger Things could be our version of that, right? Where we create a spinoff show. This is like the originals from the Vampire Diaries. You know, we have another group of 11s, all cool characters. We can make action figures. We can make merch of this. And it feels like they someone had a gun point at their head and was made to make the episode because of how different it almost feels like they was shot separately from us to the show. Like they made out episodes and someone was like, hey, we need to make another one. So they just took a different crew out and shot somewhere. Yeah. Very yeah. strange in how it plays. Very strange in how it's not consequential. And it's wonderful in how it unifies the fan base against this one thing where everyone hates it it is the lightning rod for all the criticism against the show yes it almost like it's it takes all the negativity and tunnels it towards one enemy absolutely because there will <laughs> never be an episode or content worse than this episode so you always feel a little bit better no matter what's what's on screen like, ah, season three is kind of disappointing but man they didn't have that lost sisters thing again so that's yeah. good you know <laughs> yes yes 100 percent. uh but yeah season three i uh i guess uh, we can get into that i Talking about cartoonishness, um, season three's editing for the first two episodes, which are the lowest two rated episodes if you go on IMDb's ratings for each episode, um, each being, I think, 7.0s uh, or within the 7.0 range, whereas the rest are higher. The first two episodes, breakneck pace, a new <laughs> track is played, new new retro song is played uh, every five minutes. Uh, we are jumping between characters within every couple seconds, and the way it is shot is very um sitcom-y the first two episodes in particular now the show uh, i sound like i'm criticizing season three it is not i think it's much better than season two because season two has a big problem of not being threatening there really is no like season one has threat quote unquote but it's more of a mystery and mysteries aren't perpetually threatening they're just intriguing but season two wants to try to be threatening by having the mind flare be a bigger bad guy he doesn't do anything for the whole season. So yeah. then they even rehabilitate the mind flyer in season three by making him scarier. And it's great. And you they do have get that cool moment where 11 just like annihilates him at the end of season two though. Yeah. I mean, like I said, the, the show pays off if you persevere yeah. to the end, but season two feels so much like a developed worse version of season one, whereas season three becomes much more different. I also think uh, I was reflecting on this with Catherine. This is all the Duffer brothers have been really working on. Um, and I think they have actually really liked working on the show. And so uh, that might change after season four. They might have wanted to move on, but Netflix might keep it around because Netflix is, well, they need something now after <laughs> the last few months. And uh, I think uh, it feels like the Duffer Brothers went, well, let's try something new. We want to, we're, we're stuck with Stranger Things anyway, and we like sticking around, but let's try and shoot the show differently. So the camera work for these first two episodes is very different. The tone is very different. The color correction is brighter and more poppy. Um, the the it, <laughs> Winona Ryder's entire plot line doesn't actually become serious until like episode six, because the whole time she's just like, why are magnets falling? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> this poor woman. She just can't <laughs> live in her house. <laughs> she is. She is so wonderful. Can you and- blame her, though? Like. Like thinking, I'm I'm thinking back of things that have negatively affected me for the rest of my life, right? Like those horrible moments where like kids make fun of you. Her child 
disappeared. No one believed her. It turns out horrible Eldrix monsters had taken her kid, and then yes. he was possessed by like some so with magnets Soviet down, demon or something. Yeah, so it makes total like, oh, sense. Oh no, it's happening again. You know, I don't blame her. And I love it's that like, Hopper's like, "That's weird, but I kind of believe you." Let's investigate, <laughs> and then they just go on a buddy cop adventure <laughs> where they just go do things. Um, the, the, of course, you, you get you've touched upon this a few times, but the one of the geniuses of Stranger Things is everyone always has something to do. They always have something to do, and each season is a new pairing of characters. Yes. So you never just have the same set of characters going off on an adventure. Um, the Duffer Brothers, I, I'm i positive when they're developing each story, go, here's our gu- guest of characters. Let's connect some lines and see what we want to do. There's there, there's got to be a particle board covered in string where they're figuring out how characters connect. And because right. you think about other TV shows, there'll be like episodes or seasons where a character goes to visit their parents in New York, and they just and they're never mentioned as a season, or they only show up via like phone call to friends or something. Yes. Like yes. there's no one is wasted in this show. So yeah, and they and they always come together. But yeah, you'll you'll have new pairings because character A and character B are separate characters. But when they come to char- together, they make character C. And so that's why when Steve Harrington in season two runs along with Dustin to just go to adventures, it's so wonderful. <laughs> Who he's excited to see when he visits him at work. It's a wonderful moment. Yes, in season three, it's so cool. <laughs> what is was it with you being friends with all these children? Robin <laughs> says it's so yeah. wonderful. I, I will also mention. And this is might be one of the weirdest things I'll ever say in this show. So uh, get ready. I love malls as oh, a thing. Yeah, they're I so think, cool. I think they're fun. I think they're cool. I think they're amazing as a possibility for storytelling. Malls are comprised of tiny other little worlds, all oh, one hundred stapled together. And as a and this is very bluntly used in the show, but as a symbol of like the changing of the times. And of like the 80s excess uh, versus in how it's destroying a small town, which obviously parallels actual monsters also possibly destroying a small town. It works really great here. But they're also like malls now. To me, it's interesting because they were once were this towering example of uh, progress and where we are in society success. And now they're going out of style. So now they're almost these little time capsules. (laughs) Now there's YouTube channels where they walk into dead malls, play like mall themed music in, in the video. Yeah. And just, uh, urban exploration. YouTube is really interesting. (laughs) If you want to go down a YouTube rabbit hole, urban exploration stuff is really great. So like this, the fact it's in a mall automatically brownie points with me. I'm all for it. Steve Harrington works there. It's a um, bigger budget, and it feels like that because you have extras running around in a yeah, mall. Yeah, it feels like an actual place where people are doing stuff. Yes, which that's, is I love that. It's yeah. great. And then there's that great uh, later when like uh, they have a girls' night out, or, or eleven and Max are like just hanging out at the mall and talking yes. and trash about the boys who are totally in over their heads. Uh, that's all great stuff. Sorry, I yes. feel like I interrupted you to, to no, talk about No, it's okay. It's um, I, you got into part of what makes season three so fun. I was kind of talking about what makes it feel so different, and like it makes sense, right? Because they had season one and two about a year after one another. All these actors got big, so they're in other projects, so they had to wait a bit to bring them all back together. And then season three comes out twenty nineteen, right before your friendly neighborhood pandemic, and then again we're pushing back season four uh, for a long time because of just so much going on to the point that I'm surprised they didn't do a big bigger time skip for season four where it's like only a year later and Erica is clearly 14 going I'm 11 <laughs> like okay no you're not uh, but uh, yeah season three feels a lot like the Duffer brothers just want to have uh, try out new things uh, as c- filmmakers and so a lot of seasons uh, lots of season three's episodes sometimes feel more comedic not just in the plot, but how things are handled. I mean, Hopper goes to visit like the mayor, uh, and as the mayor is telling him to, to essentially arrest protesters for their right to protest, just, despite he, the fact that they don't have he a just permit, goes ham on it. It's so great. <laughs> it's great. That scene's great. But they start playing patriotic music behind it, which sounds so silly in in context of the tone that we've been trained to engage with the first two seasons. And so season three has a very different tone. Now, of course, by the end of this this season, it develops more into what we've been used to for seasons one and two. But really, if you watch season, as as I continue to mention, the training we have developed in you, listener, over the last three years, if you were to binge this, seasons one and two feel much more similar, and season three feels completely different. Now, it feels better 
um, than seasons one and season two in particular, because it's not the same thing. Um, but it really is functionally different where characters are much more goofy. They don't get Joss Whedon where they're constantly quipping, which is I'm so happy for. This show never gets into that problem, but that's that is it is much more different and obviously noticed by IMDb people because, yeah, those first two episodes. Um, but season three then has more of a threat to it by introducing two types of villains one is the the monster itself the now more developed mind flayer which has some pretty cool horror visuals uh one in particular being when all these uh, uh brainwashed characters are walking towards the mind flayer and collapse on the ground melting into just meat there's a really creepy visual i loved that um and then the russians who subsidized a mall, <laughs> which was really great because you figure malls are, like you said, this this pioneered example of Western capitalism developing. And so the cleverness of it actually being actually the Russians subsidized this mall for their secret base is quite funny to me. Um, and so a lot of good stuff there. And uh, you have uh, we haven't even talked about uh, the references, which I think is kind of fun to talk about in the show, how they develop on that. But season one has references to Stephen King's It and E.T., Season two has an Evil Dead scene towards the end. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, but they're all in the cabin and Demogorgons are outside oh, and yeah, get yeah, quick yeah, zooms yeah, yeah. on their faces yeah. while they look around erratically, which is really fun. And then uh, season three has The Terminator just as a character <laughs> for the whole season, <laughs> which is really which funny. Which is cool. And <laughs> yeah, they also and have um, uh, this season's sad fan favorite character who dies, which is uh, which is Dimitri. Alexi. Alexi. Yes, he is. He holds the he Slurpee just wanted, and it just he, says P on it, yeah. which is really funny to me. As uh, everyone in the subreddit <laughs> said, he deserved capitalism. Like, why didn't, yeah, they, why didn't he, he get the, it? They, they why didn't it he get him. a scene with Erica? The two of them would have totally hit it off. Yeah. Erica, the, the show's patriot. <laughs> and this is, you're talking about how they kind of redeem Brett Gelman's character a bit. I, he does shine in this season where he yes, has. He's his, much better. You know, it feels and, not as gross for him to tell two adults to sleep with each other than to tell two minors to sleep with each other like he does in season two. So that's nice. (laughs) Yeah. The everything involving Hopper in the season is so like compelling. Maybe it's too strong, but like it's constantly engaging and you just love his character and his circle of people he interacts with is so good. Like he has a really fun dynamic with Murray who he is annoyed by, but he also needs and respects to an extent Yes. He obviously has the developing um, romance with Winona Ryder and the father daughter relationship he has with L- Eleven is the emotional core of this season. And it it really pays off great by the end of the season, like the stuff with him and Eleven. Um, it gives this it gives the show this like much needed kind of anchor because Stranger Things, you, you talk about how like you mentioned, how, like, is this the only thing Duffer Brothers been working on? But like, maybe this is them also being like, well, if we're going to have to do this show for the rest of our lives. I think they just like it. Like, yes, I'm going to say I, that. Honestly. I think they like it be partially because it's also this it's so weirdly open as a premise that they can just constantly go into all these other directions, both in tone. And they genre. could have gone and made a buddy cop movie, but they didn't need to because they can just send Winona Ryder and Hopper on an adventure. <laughs> they, can, they, they can write in yeah, a couple episodes. They steal year. a car. Uh, they they get their adventure music they get to fight russians they're running away from a terminator it's like they have some really 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 cool stuff they get to go back to their childhood bedroom open up like their toy box or look at what posters they have on the wall like i want to do that next yeah (laughs) then they just get to do that uh but yeah like the stuff that happens in stranger things can get so abstract and weird um which i think if you just asked anyone like who's seen stranger things like oh what's the full plot and story of stranger things I don't think they could because they explode. They just, <laughs> I've never thought about it. <laughs> they're like, yeah, there's Russians and they're doing something and it ties, <laughs> the upside down exists somewhere, you know. But Conversely, like, though, if you ask them about a character, they can tell you everything about that character. Yes. Yeah. They and we haven't really talked about like Mike and Eleven's like romance and how it develops across seasons because season two has that nice dance scene where they have this cool dance, which then becomes oh, spooky. I love that. You know, That's great. It's Dustin so cute. struggles to dance with anyone and he dances with Nancy because it's so sweet. It's cute. <laughs> yeah. That's it, again, that's where the characters keep you engaged and they pay off. And then there's that big twist where there's the giant monster watching them or whatever. Um, and here, like they actually go through the growing pains of a young 
couple where at first they just they're constantly kissing and around each other, which drives Hopper insane. But then also <laughs> Mike is annoying. Uh, <laughs> so, yes. And so that eventually annoys Eleven. He's very Mordecai. He's so lame. Yes. He's a really lame boyfriend. Yes. <laughs> he doesn't know how to say I love you. Like, what a loser. <laughs> uh, parallel awesome. to this, we're also sometimes when we're eating dinner at my house, we'll just put on an episode of regular show just to have something on. And like watching back at it yeah mordecai kind of is terrible like he's, he's, he's such, a great character but yes he is very lame he's, he's so, so dumb like, he doesn't yeah. know him to do anything <laughs> and that is very much mike uh finn wolfhard's character yeah. here um but yeah someone like, make they, that edit make finn wolfhard look like mordecai make it make that monstrous <laughs> photo edit real, real, real just quick just every time he's supposed to scream and just goes whoa yeah <laughs> oh, yeah season three is a huge step up for season two in my opinion like yes, in, just yes. there's everything like you and get better if you, characters if it's not just a big budget with the mall but then they have a fourth of july parade which is just tons of cool scenes and it's just it really it it is good television and it's amazing that even season two being a low point still has some really interesting stuff and just the whole the whole time the show is consistently really rewarding to watch and uh has just wonderful scenes where i'm cheering or i'm laughing they have good like violence and horror whenever it comes up that makes it really cool um it's just good they they never don't know how to at least fix something that comes along um and that's uh that's really nice for a show because i've never really i mean like i said i stopped after season two that one time but when you persevere it's worth it um I've never really watched a show that so consistently is good, except for like something dreadful like Breaking Bad, or which is really great show. But boy, that is a rough show to watch. Uh, my wife is going through it again, and I'm getting flashbacks of just because she's never watched it before. I'm like, oh my gosh, you have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea how evil he gets. It's crazy. Yeah, and as and someone she's... who has not watched past, I think partially through season two because they just find Heisenberg um, to be such a dislikable person that they just can't keep watching and i'm like wow like <laughs> you really opted out before he becomes like a, just like an absolute monster but it's a, um, yeah it's great but to, it's to continue our steve harrington watch um he <laughs> <laughs> I he's love, great like, isn't he? his he's development great. as a character like he goes from like the typical 80s bully to friend of children to like platonic ally for ethan hawk's daughter like like his constant like ev- evolution is just a great dude who doesn't like who's just like <sighs> like he doesn't get anything he wants it's really interesting like everything he tries to achieve he fails at like from everything from small things like dating nancy to uh trying to date ethan hawk's daughter which also to fails. getting a job at a video store which robin has to help out with yes yeah. uh robin's <laughs> um once you point out that it's ethan hawk's daughter you can't unsee it like and it's Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman's daughter, right? Right. It's one or the other. Whether once you find out it's one of them, you're gonna always see Uma Thurman or Ethan Hawke. It's, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> like, but like he just he's just along for the ride, and he's like, ah, oh, okay. <laughs> so it just keeps going. Um, again, like, but like, it's is he Sisyphus? Is he the Sisyphus of the show? <laughs> he's always know. he's pushing the ball up, and it always falls down. But the joy of being able to at least well, do something like, is what's the, good. Except he makes progress, you know. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> uh, but it, you know, it, it's it's he, yeah, he. It's it's interesting because he starts as one archetype and they just keep deconstructing it over and over again until he's just like it's wholly unique character. Where yeah. I can't think of another character in another show that's like steve harrington really like it's it's kind of that thing where a show will have a villain but once the heroes defeat the villain they just are in the show still and just join the fan group except he wasn't really a villain either he just was kind of a jerk so he was kind of a jerk but he also like uh from the start of even season one he's yeah he's a jerk but he still has like a conscience um there's always that's always there he's still kind of a misogynist because he's he's like pretty mean to his friend's girlfriend like really aggressive but that's that's that 80s charm of uh of 80s misogyny and but to, to he, be fair like charlie heaton was was taking pictures of them unbeknownst to right, them 100 percent. yeah and so, so like yeah that's why like at the end of season one it didn't bother me that he was friends with or she was still nancy was still dating steve and then even season two that's why i was like why are we jumping so quickly to putting that fan pairing together of Charlie Heaton and, and Nancy Wheeler? Cause like, 
Because Steve he's, Harrington he, is so much more interesting when he's just kind of a weird loser. Yeah, I mean, even he's taking care of her at the at the party and is like, yo, I think you're drinking too much. She's like, well, you told me to act normal. <laughs> just like, yeah, but don't get wasted. What are you doing? You're a minor. Oh, man. Yeah, and notice how he's the one person I keep. I just call him Steve Harrington. I don't call him his actor name because to me, he just is Steve Harrington. Yes. Uh, Joe Carey is very good as an actor, by the way. He's in um, he's in one of my favorite movies, Spree. Oh, that's right. Which you keep trying to get me to watch, but I, I that was my number one of that year until I think I saw Feels Good Man, which is a great documentary about Pepe the Frog and <laughs> the guy who made it. I don't know if you've seen that, but now that, I, I know the story. I haven't seen it. I, I know that great. story. It's it's emotional. I mean, it's this the idea of someone taking your art and turning it into something monstrous and just seeing what that's like for somebody. I mean, it's it's a it's really great. But Spree is uh, about an Uber driver who. The whole premise is he's going to live stream killing people while he does, is an Uber driver. And it's not graphic, but it's 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 really good. And he's very good um, in that. And uh, he, he just plays a crazy person who with greasy hair super well. He plays an incel perfectly. I mean, he basically plays an incel as Stephen Harrington, but not as a uh, cringy, just uh, just involuntary. That's that's what we'll run with. But he's good. Uh, but yeah, so season three uh really solid i like the i like conspiracy theories so obviously i was totally down for the russian do, stuff do you like how the season starts with people melting <laughs> they're I like do. this ain't your dad stranger things <laughs> and it's just like <laughs> i like just the whole thing of like <laughs> yeah i like the whole thing of like he's creating almost like an army of like people or whatever like i think that's really cool i'm not really clear on what the upside down creatures like plan is but it's not really important i don't think they're just bad and they're trying to destroy the world. And then actually that's what's interesting about season four is you get more of like a specific motivation for the creature of the season or every other season is just a creature that's doing something. Yeah. And then here it's like in season four, it's more a whatever. Yeah. We don't, we haven't really talked much about the actual monster stuff. I think it's because a less memorable outside of the moments that happen. Well, even season one, like Brenner being the human villain doesn't have a character, but he's still an interesting villain. Like the, just the idea of big G man. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. He, he's, um, he's a man in black. That's, and then the Demogorgon cool. is just a monster in the monster movie, which is cool. Uh, season oh, yeah. two, the mind flare, like I said, really isn't all that threatening. Um, he just sort of takes over will. And then that's it. Like the show never really has, People go missing. Will doesn't like get used to kill somebody, which would have been kind of neat. And like they just do the Demogorgon thing over again. Although I do wish Dart made it to the end. He's the uh, subtitled fan favorite character of season two who also dies. But and then season three does add some threat, but it's not as threatening as we get into season four, which I'm so thankful for to finally have that. Um, It really helps season four to have a villain who actually is like a threat to our characters. And, um, but season three does of course add in the Russians, which is itself more of a threat. Like just, okay, it's the cold war. Got it. I, uh, that's all I need, uh, yeah. <laughs> to know that these guys are bad guys and just the, just the way each character is get paired. And then like, just the fact that Steve Harrington has a connection to the government because of all the past events but he just sends children to go investigate a Russian <laughs> like <laughs> base. I just, all oh, that's great. And it's, so it makes the show way more enjoyable uh, that they just, everyone's so just as the show is metatextually confident in leading you down rabbit holes that, you know, will pay off. So are our characters way in over our heads as they complete each task and could clearly just call up their friends from the government to, to solve some problems. Uh, but whatever (laughs) like okay the terminator is coming at you do you want to call somebody like there's russians got to figure something out here but uh how did you feel about i I think hopper has a great self-sacrifice moment they read his letter over the over the ending montage great stuff and then it's um revealed at the end that he's alive in russia somewhere how did you feel about that so in season three's ending they don't reveal that he is alive they do say uh, they're going to feed someone to a Demogorgon and they say, not the American pointing to a door, but you don't know who it is, but you could go, oh, it's Hopper. But yeah, yeah. you never know, because like you, there are plenty of Americans that well, they could have had. <laughs> and the show clearly likes to take characters and put them in bizarre places so they can do whatever. But yes, Hopper does have a a die off camera scene, so he's not actually dead as far as a movie's concerned. Um, but during 2020... They released a trailer for season four, which has and the trailer <laughs> is essentially the scene 
of it's basically this uh star wars episode 7 trailer where finn just stands up and music plays uh that's what they do but with hopper in a russian prison so i had already i the only reason i knew hopper was going to quote unquote die in season three is because i saw in the comments of that video i thought hopper was dead <laughs> and so i was like oh okay i guess they're just gonna spoil it there but of course before we get into season four, but they do pretty much right away start teasing Hopper might be alive, Hopper might be alive, and then of course Hopper is in fact alive. Um, I think uh, <laughs> I don't think it takes away from the drama of season three's ending because uh, the real thing is that you know a combination of two things. One, narratively, Hopper has been taken away from his emotional uh, connections, and so that's difficult. And two. Millie Bobby Brown is a really, really, really good performer. Extremely good performer. Um, YMS has a criticism for people who try to cry in movies as they just blink a lot because they're stressing out tears. Uh, Millie Bobby Brown doesn't do that. She just cries. and <laughs> She could just do it and start having tears run down her eyes. Or even in uh, Top Gun Maverick, you just have Tom Cruise staring at Val Kilmer and uh, water just wells up in his eyes. I don't know how you do that. <laughs> but he's the, so all that... All I have to say is you have a good performance that is able to make it emotional. And to really assert this, uh, we were watching the final episode of season three. Catherine then left to go do something. We finished the episode afterward, and it was pretty much at this scene where his final monologue is. And it still made me emotional, like just kind of drawing on that, despite knowing that he was alive in season four. Catherine did not know that yet because she hadn't seen the trailer yet. Um, so I, I think it's fine. I think if it's a good story, you can do stuff like that. Um, because like I said, the, the, it's not like it's much better that he's not dead because right now he's in a Russian prison. <laughs> That's like, I feel like that would be functionally worse than just being dead. That's true. That's um, true. but I do think there's something to be said about the fact that we start the season with seeing how bad it is for this device to break, that it literally causes people to fly into the air and melt. <laughs> And then to see that all he had to do was jump behind something and he'd be okay. <laughs> like, I mean, they even reassert it that when it explodes, the people who walked into the room to stop him just melt <laughs> again. So they're really letting you know that, hey, if you're in this room, you're going to melt. And then, you know, he's fine. So, um, but you, you know what? Every show gets something. They get like, I, I said it before, like a strike system. It can be however many strikes you want, but they have a strike system of doing something that goes a little bit against their own logic. And uh, you get a couple of those and they usually work as long as it works narratively and it works narratively. Like you get to have a cool ending. You get the monologue of him reading, like he actually shares his feelings, which is really sweet. Um, I love the way Har David Arbor just reads the word environment. Um, so, <laughs> so it's just really funny. So you hear him do that. Um, which we haven't mentioned in some of the comedy stuff of the show, but the fact that the Duffer brothers are so good at doing clever comedy. So like the fact that the car they steal just has the license plates. Todd father is just really funny. <laughs> the fact that the chips of Hawaii outfit, they have to put on this terrible hat <laughs> and like, they just have such clever quotable comedy throughout the show. Mouth breather, stuff like that. The Eagle waffles. They're really good at just, uh, doing movie things that are fun for everybody to talk about that even though there can be a criticism over stranger things about how much they reference and talk about other things or just literally have the terminator in the show um they always have fun original stuff that we're not talking about the terminator from the show we're talking about todd father and how he got his car stolen or other stupid things like that or how there's coke play product placements always in the show yeah but like it's the <laughs> it's og so coke stuff though so i, I know, like it. it's great um, i do think like i people talk about the the references and nostalgia of it, but like i do think that they do a good job of making it very natural like it doesn't feel out of place like oh it just, yeah like i love it's clever. all the scenes where winona riders at work because yes. all the logos and all the boxes are appropriate or at least close enough where i don't notice if they're not period accurate or whatever yes like that stuff i like and it but it, like she doesn't just like really pull up like a she doesn't go hey check out this rubik's cube you know it's just like there might be one in the background the worst one is in season two when they visit barb's family and they're eating kfc 
and uh, Nancy leaves the table because she's feeling emotionally upset. And Steve just has a piece of chicken, takes a bite, looks at the parents, and then basically the, you could just have a look at the camera and go, wow, it's finger licking good. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and even like the shot is a wide shot of the table and it's like perfectly set up like a commercial. It's, it is really bad, but like, you just kind of get over it. I think that's an it. outlier, though, compared to the, rest <laughs> that, of the That show. one is a serious outlier. <laughs> and it's also Netflix going, oh, we got a show everybody's watching. Get the product placement. Get it. It, it does <laughs> feel like, yeah, it does. Feel like, I think that's why oh, season yeah. one probably does the best is because it wasn't being as watched over compared to compared to other stuff. Yeah. Um, and then later, like season four um, has some very, um, I don't even call it product placement, but like they really play into some of the iconography of the time but it, it's really like important to the plot so it's stuff all the stuff with dungeon and dragons like specifically or the um uh the satanic panic stuff they do yeah which is which is really good i really like that uh but yeah melvin would you recommend stranger things 100 percent. yeah <laughs> i it's there's really nothing like stranger things um it's funny to say that because it copies so much stuff but it's this uh everything kind of imitates everything in some way this is just more heavy-handed at times but it's such a good um, culmination of things people like put into something and then performed extremely well by um, an amazing cast of, at the time, unknown actors, except for Winona Ryder, really, who really is at the tail end of their career. Not in the sense that they were falling off, but they just weren't picking up projects that probably required a lot because they were just like, well, I got to make money and I like doing my job. So I do it. And then they land on this where it's like, great. And, and she's so fun to watch throughout the show. Um, just the way she like uh, piggybacks off of other people whenever they're doing things like <laughs> winking at, uh, what's, what's the guy in season four? I don't know. Anyways, this is, she's, she's just so charming. Everybody's great. Everybody's absolutely great. So yeah, if you haven't watched it because you're, I don't know, living under a rock or you're some sort of like hipster purist who doesn't watch things other people like, and you just watch like that. I think on Letterboxd, there's literally a film called paint drying and you think that's excellent. Like, I guess it's about time you be normal and actually have friends and check out stranger things. So you can actually talk about something at the, at the proverbial water cooler that exists somewhere on the earth that I don't think is real. So yeah, this is a, it's a good show. Consistently great. Season two is a bit of a low point, but it still has things to really enjoy and like with that, with, like I said, good performances at the very least. And then season three is a really interesting adventure into just some more efficient filmmaking. And then yeah, season four is just good stuff. So uh, did I say season three or season f- I, season three being the efficient one? And then, yeah, season four is just some really good culmination of, of some extremely fun, scary, good stuff. So, yeah, definitely, definitely recommend all of it. How, how about you, Dan? Oh, yeah. I mean, you don't need me to tell you Stranger Things. It's yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, it's it's yeah, it's one of the few things out there, I think, that is both really hyped up and popular, but also like genuinely deserving of that level of like widespread acclaim and love. I know, like, a lot of people leading up to season four, because people start talking about how season four is really good, and I'd overhear conversations with so many people, and they say something like, I haven't seen it since season one, I've only watched season one. Um, It's worth the investment, you know, especially now that, like, you have a one nine-episode season, another eight-episode season, and then you have season four. Like, it's not that much of a time commitment compared to some other shows. Yeah, they Uh, may be an hour, but they go quick. They really go quick. Yeah, and a lot happens, and... I, I don't know. I, I, there's it's not funny. much else to say. It's They're a really, really enjoyable funny. show yeah. that uh, does the whole nostalgia thing right. And yeah, it's it takes a lot of elements, but everything is tropey to some extent. It's how you utilize those ingredients and what you make with them. And I think Stranger Things makes a really fun, like uh, hybrid thing that covers a lot of genres. Like I really love realistic things that have with a tinge of unreality in them. And Stranger Things is that type of science fiction where it's a mostly realistic world. But there's this one thing that's really off and it's the upside down and the way that people have connected to it. And so that, that really scratches a couple of particular itches for me. So big fan of Stranger Things. Highly recommend it. If you've listened this far into our episode on it, you probably like it too. So. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of Cinematic Doctrine. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving a review and subscribing to the podcast. And as mentioned before, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you're opted into a once a month movie poll where you decide a movie we discuss on the podcast. There are other unique benefits that come with supporting the podcast, so be sure to check that out at patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine. 
A special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier on Patreon. Thank you so much, Mom, Dad, Melanie, Sherlyon, and Thomas. You guys are the best, and your continued monetary support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, stay cool. Want some Cinematic Doctrine swag? You're in luck. We've got 3-inch Cinematic Doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine, link in the show notes, and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too. But let's be real, the podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.